Hi and welcome. My name is Joanne Wright from the Professional Development Department and the proud host of The Why of Teaching. Tonight's topic is reading across the content area. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome back. Teaching across the content area is not just about teaching reading strategies in isolation. It's about teaching students how to use a text to productively struggle through their thinking and make sense of what they're reading. I'm honored today to be joined by some middle school teachers across our district. Would you mind introducing yourself? Tina Papian, I teach US history, eighth grade at Tyrone Middle School. I'm Jennifer Rivera. I teach science, Pinellas Park Middle School, 6th grade and 8th grade. I'm Michelle Anderson. I'm the K-8 Social Studies Specialist. I'm Brandi Alahuzis. I teach 7th grade civics at Carwise Middle School. And I'm Jennifer Oots. I teach the 6th grade accelerated math program at Seminole Middle School. So we were so honored to see your videos um, and to just see some amazing reading strategies that we were able to witness. Um, Tina, in your video, you are sporting some type of a wig and you are preparing your students to in argue character. with one another. So Would you like ready. to explain to our audience going what's to going to on in your video? Yes, so our lesson point. that day was the, the Patriots versus the Loyalists and they were going to be preparing to make an argument for either side and why the other students should join their side. So they were beginning with some background reading in order to gather the information they needed to make their argument. So what specific reading strategy did you use with them? I used reciprocal reading. So in the reciprocal reading, they were with a partner. One partner would read the text, the next partner would summarize the text, and they would agree on their summaries and then record their summaries. There's a lot of fear when it comes to reading out to an entire class. So when um, in the reciprocal reading strategy specifically, they're able to model that with a partner instead of to the whole class. So it, it becomes a smaller environment for them, which is a safer environment for them to practice that. Plus, as they get to hear um, not just themselves, but their partner read, it helps them to better understand maybe some of the terms that they would struggle with. And Michelle, um, serving as our coach on our show today, would you like to speak a little bit about reciprocal reading and the various ways that it can be used? So reciprocal reading is a reading strategy we employ when we have students engaging in longer pieces of text and complex text. And the purpose of using reciprocal reading is actually twofold. We have students engaged in reading and going through the passages, but we also have the ability for them to practice summarizing. And actually, a third, in addition, they're able to hear from other students how they think about the text. So one partner will read, the other will, will summarize, and then they switch those roles. So once one person has read and the other summarized, now the person who has summarized will read and the other will summarize. So by switching these roles, we have the students practicing both parts of the strategy, and then at the same time, they're able to hear from each other how they think through text. And I did notice in your video that you did a lot of modeling for your students. Was that a very purposeful move? Yes. So it's important for them to understand first what the expectations are and to see and hear what those expectations are. So in the video, I have a student read a part of the passage and then I summarize and we agree on that summary and then we switch roles. So they get the opportunity to see how both roles work as well as modeling how to read the text um, in case they don't understand how to pronounce the words. How does that help prepare them for the next activity? For the next activity, when they are released to do this with a partner, they are going to make sure I can hear them uh, saying or speaking the text. They are going to make sure I can hear them summarizing the text and I can see them writing. I want to hear someone reading from every group. I want to hear another person summarize and I want to see everybody writing their summaries, okay? Remember your group needs to agree on the summary before you write it down and that way I can monitor for their understanding. They're comprehending what they're reading and they're comprehending what they're writing. And Jennifer, uh, you began your class with offering your students a number of ways to mark the text so up. You had examples of um, 
predictions, things they disagreed with, um, things they agreed with, the vocabulary that they were perhaps struggling with. How has marking the text benefited your students understanding the content? It was really interesting to use the new symbols that were introduced to them. Uh, this article was really complex because it was about classification of living things and it's a uh, it's something that they fear, some big scientific words, they mm. usually fear them. And it's a really good article because it slowly introduces them to what is going on, um, who is a person who came up with this, definitions. So with the symbols, they get to, it's sort of like a game. So they see what symbols um, we're gonna use, they decide which ones they're gonna use first, they start reading, they look, and um, their choices represent their understanding of the text. So mm -hmm. every time they're using, for example, the swirl that means make a prediction, they have to really think about it. They have to read the text and really think about it because they just can put a, can't put a random swirl anywhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, the symbols have purpose. So every time I know they're using a symbol, I know they understand the symbol and mm -hmm. I know they understand the sentence where they're using it at. Mm -hmm. So it helps me really know that they get it, they mm. understand what the text is, is showing them, the new knowledge that I mm. want them to understand, what their learning target is for the day. And um, Michelle, as our coach on our show today, um, is there one way to mark up a text or can we use it for multiple purposes? No, text marking is one of the reading strategies that can be used in multiple ways with multiple types of texts. Um, what it's really a beautiful use of is getting kids to get to central ideas, main ideas, but then also to make connections across um, different areas of their learning. So whether we're asking them to activate prior knowledge or if we're asking them to make connections even between disciplines. So text marking is amazingly versatile and it can be used across all subject areas. And do you feel that it's a strategy that should be reserved for our struggling students or is it beneficial to all students? It's beneficial to all students. So what we're asking um, in our classrooms and what we're asking of our, our students is to always be challenged by what they read. So we can do differentiation in giving different levels of text to different students and then the text marking is a scaffold for all students. So whether we're asking them again to find main idea or if we're asking them to make different connectivity points um, by varying the text, this remains a perfect scaffold for all students. Jennifer, what was the learning target for your lesson that we saw? We were focused on learning what the Linnean classification of living things is, uh, where did it come from, and how to use it. So the intimidation of scientific words, we put it in the back burner, we don't think about that, this is middle school. Mm. We just want them to understand where it came from, how classifying living things is important, um, and also who the scientist was, who's very important. Talk about the scientist, what his thinking was behind that, so that they can understand how a hierarchical organization is used in science. How do you attack um, scientific vocab words? Those are very intimidating. When we start with a unit, I usually give them a word wall. So they are assigned a word and they have to represent it in a picture. They have an index card, very large index card, and they draw whatever it is that they thinking or what their connection is with the word. On the other side, they try to make up a definition in their own words. We do not front load vocabulary. We do not give them books. We want to see what they know already. That's the first step. That's my way of engaging them. Mm -hmm. And they're also kind of exploring also what that word is. Mm -hmm. They might have difficulty with it. They might ask me a few questions, but never to give the definition is my goal. It sounds like you're constantly revisiting and incorporating that vocabulary. Yes, we need to do that in science just because there are specific things that they need to know. Once mm -hmm. they get to eighth grade, they have the big uh, SSA. Mm. So that science assessment, if they don't understand scientific terms, they won't understand what the question is asking of them. So, um, And so Brandy, actually moving over to your lesson, um, I noticed that your students were collaboratively working and they were charting something and you had mentioned a few times that you were preparing them to teach the class. What were you asking of your students? 
Well, for this lesson, um, we were learning about the ideas and the complaints set forth in the Declaration of Independence. And so with this lesson, I have the students teach the other students what, what the complaints were and how they led to the breaking up between England and what would become the United States of America. So when we chart the text, we, we, we use marking the text, and they were marking for three different concepts, the complaints that were set forth, the role of the government, and the, um, the natural rights that are given to all citizens. That is a um, piece of complex text, if I've ever read one. Yes. <laughs> what strategies did you employ to help your students decode that? Well, I used two. Um, the first one I used was reciprocal reading. So the students um, would read a section and to another student, and that student would summarize it back to them, and then they would discuss that. And then we, they were also in that summary and, and the reading of it, they were looking for those key th points, the role of the government, the complaints, and they had to highlight either underlining it and making the R for the role of government or the C for complaint, or they were using three different colors to, um, for our visual learners that was helping. How did you prepare your students to do that? Well, a, a few things. I, I always start with something small and little, so the strategy you saw in this lesson was not the first time the students had used it. Um, I used a simple text that really didn't mean anything um, to just get them introduced to the, uh, to the activity. So when it was something harder, it wasn't a foreign concept to them. And if I can interject here. Mm. Um, I would like to speak to that as well because I saw it not only in, in Brandy's video, I actually saw it in all of the videos, that all of these teachers, when they're preparing the students to read complex text, they model their thinking so that the students aren't just thrown into a piece of text and sort of said, well, go figure it out. Um, they show the students this is how the strategy works and they use the text that the students are using to read through a portion of it and um, to practice the summarizing or to practice the text marking so that the students feel confident going into working on their own or in their collaborative groups. And speaking about collaboration, um, Michelle, we definitely saw collaboration throughout all these lessons that we saw today. How does working with other students help uh, move their own learning forward? Collaboration is a, an immensely powerful tool that we all have at our disposal rubber when bands, we're working right? with our we students. In every classroom, you have students together. at varying levels. So Even when you have students in um, a, 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 an advanced classroom or a regular classroom, you still have varied levels of readers and writers. And um, by allowing students to work collaboratively, you're allowing them to hear how other people think so that they can internalize that and practice that as well. I can imagine with reading strategies and specifically, um, that's, that's a productive struggle all within itself. So it's critical for other students to be able to hear your thinking and um, the old saying, we learn what we teach. And so it allows them the opportunity to teach their peers as well. And when we come back, we look forward to hearing from Jennifer as she takes us on the journey of what we saw in her classroom. I had teachers that inspired me all throughout from elementary school on and I was actually fortunate enough after I graduated to go back and teach at the school with my fourth grade teacher who made a really big impact on me and I got to tell him, hey, you're a big reason of why I became a teacher. And all of the teachers that stand out in my mind are the ones that cared about me the most, the ones who made learning fun. And I realized that I have completely modeled myself as a teacher after those people. I am so fortunate to be part of a profession that impacts everyone. There's not a single person that hasn't had some kind of influence by a teacher, and I just feel so fortunate to be able to be a part of that. And I work with brilliant minds every day, and I work with these young people who look up to me, and it's an unbelievable feeling, and I really just, I couldn't imagine myself in any other profession.
Hi, welcome back. Jennifer, as we look to your video, you're a math teacher. How do you employ reading strategies in math? What does that look like? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I was a little not clear about what that did look like. Um, when I first got asked to do the show and uh, they said reading strategies, I thought, mm, I think that you might not be wanting to ask the math teacher. <laughs> but the truth is we really do a lot of reading strategies in math. Um, one of the things that we do is multiple representations. It's important for kids to see things in multiple ways. For them to see, for example, in the lesson we were doing, we were looking at equivalent expressions. It's important for kids to see things algebraically, like two times the quantity n plus three and two n plus six are equivalent expressions, but also to see things visually and to see things verbally. Well, representations is important, but another important part in math is constructing a viable argument. Um, one of the things I do a lot with my kids is the idea of convincing yourself is the, like, the lowest level of convincing. Convincing a friend is the kind of a little higher level, and then convincing a skeptic is the highest level. So it's important for kids to be able to construct a viable enough argument that they can convince students who might not originally agree with them that, that yeah, this really does work. Michelle, do you have any um, contributions you would like to make to math? Um, and reading across content areas? Absolutely, and I really was very impressed by what Jennifer was doing in her math classroom to have students interacting and using reading strategies um, to engage with each other and to learn about her content area. And so, as she was saying, when they were um, when they were comparing the written math sentence, so the words two plus a number equals um, and they have to then match that to the mathematical expression, that is very much an important reading strategy. And then to take it up to another level, they also then had to match those two expressions to a visualization. And so using their strategies for understanding imagery and then matching that to text is a very important um, part of our teaching reading to kids. Um, and then she's also working with her kids to construct a viable argument. And in doing that, she is teaching her kids how to have academic conversations, how to be able to express yourself to someone who is perhaps not agreeing with you and not devolving into being defensive or striking out. So by teaching them how to have these academic conversations, she's teaching them um, ultimately how to be good um, conversationalists and to be able to make meaning out of what other people are saying to them. And what was going on in your lesson? There were students working collaboratively. They were walking around the room, sticking notes on top of problems that you had posted. And there were sightings of a deck of cards. Would you like to explain <laughs> what we saw? <laughs> So one of the things that I've been trying this year is something called visible random groupings, where the kids come in and they just really never know who's going to be in their group that day. And I think it's important for kids to get a chance to work with other kids. Um, you know, so eloquently you said earlier about the collaboration, it's really important for kids to get a like almost get into the brain of another kid and hear what they're saying and, and coming up with different ways of thinking of things. Like that's really how you develop your own reasoning skills is by listening to other kids reason. And so the kids are in, in groups each day that are completely different and that's where the deck of cards came in is that's how they, they got into their groups. And they were also standing up at the board, which is another thing I've been trying to do this year is the idea of a vertical non-permanent surface. So the kids are working on vertical surfaces so they can look around the room and see what other kids are doing. And it's non-permanent, so they're willing to take risks. So they write something down and then they decide, oh no, that's not what I want to write down and they can erase it. So they're much more willing to um, you know, make mistakes, which is good. And the other thing I really liked about this activity is the kids had cards and they were taping them and it gave them flexibility to say, uh, I'm going to start with my card here, but this isn't permanent. I'm allowed to move it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, once I hear someone else say, oh, 
are you sure it goes there? Can you convince me of that? Then it's a lot of times in their convincing, they decide that that might not be the best placement for the card. And I noticed that you offered students an opportunity to think out their, their argument um, on paper. They were actually formulating that, um, writing that down before they were having those conversations. Yeah, the kids are pretty used to at this point knowing that they could get called on to come in front of the class and explain their thinking. And so they've all kind of learned that if you can think about things ahead of time and write things out ahead of time, then um, it, it makes it a little easier to explain. There were uh, moments when you were discussing with students, um, you were clarifying some of their thinking or they seemed to be asking you questions. Mm -hmm. um, how do you guide students when they have a misconception yeah, that's a good question. You know, one, one of the things that I always tell my kids is that I promise I will never take away their aha moment. That would be the worst thing that I could ever do as a teacher. And so a lot of times when the kids ask me questions, I kind of turn it around and say, gosh, that's a great question. And then the, sometimes they get a little frustrated by that. But, you know, they, they've learned that, oh, maybe I need to really think about this question. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I like to do a lot is sometimes in math they get a little overwhelmed. Like, I just don't know what to do. I don't even know where to start. And so one of the things that we talk about a lot is, well, what do you know? Like when you look at this problem, what about it do you know how to do? And that's a really great place to start with what do you already know? And so a question I have then for the group is what, what are some of the barriers that you faced with applying reading strategies in your content areas? Sometimes you hear the, we gotta read today, but I've trained them because the reading is going to be fun. If if I'm gonna give them something to read, it's something that I like, and I always promise them, oh my gosh, and I, I get them excited, I get them engaged, you're gonna like this. Okay, I got something we're gonna read today, it's really, really good, okay? So I get them excited about it, and then they trust me that it's not gonna be something boring, and they look forward to it, so they get engaged, and it works out in the end, so it's one of the things that I like to do. Teachers are looking to get their hands on a text set what advice do you have for them as far as how to go about getting one and um, what types of tech sets should they be looking for? I like News ELA because um, especially with social studies um, you have the varying Lexile levels so you'll have the same article but you can have it in three to four different Lexile so that's a great way to scaffold where and the students may not even realize that you have scaffolded it because the basic article looks the same but the, the, work, the workers of News ELA have rewritten the article enough where it's written to, a, to their level, and that's a great way to scaffold. Hmm. I would say additionally, um, for social studies, there are tons of resources, mm -hmm. and you can use anything from a picture you know, so it, you can get things from, I like to use Library of Congress a lot to get either images or images of documents, um, and then we analyze those as well, and they can pull information from that the same way they could from the textbook, from a reading passage. Um, or sometimes just Googling an image. If you have a concept you're trying to think of, you can just type it in, look it up, and have them analyze that. And I noticed that you used that um, as your opening hook and it was a simpler form um, for students to try and understand your concept because you moved from that to a more complex piece of text in your lesson. Yes, and then as we go throughout the week, we will revisit the same image or the same piece of text and we will make it more complex as they go. So they begin with something very simple, something comfortable, might be challenging for a few students, but for the most part it's something that they understand how to do. And then throughout the week they have to build on it and they have to really dissect it. Our curriculum guides are a great place to find resources and they have been vetted and also a lot of those curriculum guides were worked on by fellow teachers. And so what types of feedback have your students offered you um, as you've employed these reading strategies in your classrooms? With the reciprocal reading, my lower level students have thanked okay, so me sometimes for that because it has given them a chance to 
get the work done when they wouldn't have gotten the work done if I had just given them that reading and said, here, read it, answer this question. They, the fear is gone. They have someone to lean on, not to get the answer from, but to work with. You're going to have to teach this Declaration of Independence to the rest of the class. Well, I can say with the article for science, I heard people say, oh, I found Duke the dog because there were pictures in there too. And uh, also somebody else, uh, well, a couple of people said, this was easy, Ms. Rivera. So that being said, um, they start out uh, with a little bit of fear. The freedom that they had in choosing colors for the symbols was another thing that comes to mind too. They like using highlighters. They like using different types of uh, colored pens. So they, they liked the activity because I gave them a little bit of freedom and um, I got feedback from that too. So. I also noticed in your video a student had a question for you mm -hmm. and you redirected them to the text where they had marked it up and yes. they were able to get the answer straight away. We could just see it in their face. They had that aha moment. Yes. That was really special. Which is what Jennifer was talking about, that's right. Yeah. And when we come back, we're going to hear our favorite analogies for teaching. I became a teacher because after watching my dad change many lives, I spent a lot of time in school. I volunteered during summer school with him and it just kind of inspired me to really, you know, go into teaching because I knew that that's something that I was passionate about and that I felt that I could go to work every day and change lives. One of my teachers was Mrs. Slusser and up until second grade, I really, I read but I wasn't really fond of reading. And so all year we spent time finding that perfect book. And when I got hooked on a series, The Boxcar Children, I'll never forget. So she fed my love for learning along with my dad. I absolutely love that aha moment when students find out that they can do something that they thought was impossible at the beginning. And now that it's possible, they're like, oh my gosh, I can do that. Uh, when I, the other day I had a student who before could never add two digit numbers together. And she's like, wait, wait, I got that answer. And I, and I know how to do it and I have a different strategy and it was just amazing to see her confidence level rise. She had the smile on her face the entire day because she now met a goal that she set. Hi and welcome back. We're going to do a fire round of favorite teaching analogies. You ready? Let's begin. My favorite teaching analogy would probably be being a cheerleader for the students. They might not win every game, but you're always going to be there to support them and get them to the next game. My analogy would be, it's sort of like drama. This is my show. You're here to have fun. You're here because you want to be here. and. Let's go ahead and do a Harry Potter lab. That's why I dressed up for you, so let's go. <laughs> for me, teaching is like, teachers are like 911 dispatchers. We assess the problem from what we hear the kids calling for help. We figure out what resources they need to get them through, and we always let them know that it's going to be okay. Mine is a juggler. I'm having to know all the students' wants, needs, in a classroom and trying to find a way to get all of that to work and make it a pretty show. I think I'm a tour guide. It's my job to help the kids see amazing learning destinations and then they can go explore whatever they'd like. So I want to really thank you guys for taking the time out to let us into your classroom and open up your world to us a little bit. And I think our key takeaway for tonight is that reading strategies definitely do not only belong in a reading classroom. Thank you so much for tuning in.